guys. Uh, time for a bit of a property market update. It's been a little while since we uh, have done one of these. Uh, I think some of the reports have been a bit slow, sort of December, January, as they usually are, but uh, we are back full steam ahead uh, this side of the year, jumping into the February charts. As usual, we're gonna go through two main reports. Uh, it's the CoreLogic February 2023 report and then the uh, the RBA chart pack uh, released in February as well. Um, this is the first time I've gone through those reports as uh, usual, so I get the same sort of data information as you guys are relaying it so we can go through it together, which I'm super keen about. Um, pretty interesting time in the market, I guess. Uh, feeling on the ground was sort of first week after Australia Day that weekend, uh, it seemed like most markets sort of picked a little bit up again where there was you know, people coming back from holidays, people going on, lots of people coming through the open homes. At least there was uh, over here in the Gold Coast, don't know about anywhere else across the country. Uh, but that was sort of the general consensus and feel and I guess that's what we sort of see this time of the year is after that Australia Day weekend, um, the market starts to pick back up, listing starts to come on the market, everyone comes back from home and those, you know, those delayed thoughts of you know putting the property on the market or potentially buying something start to come back into play where we're not on holidays or taking time off work or anything else like that. So it'll uh, be interesting to sort of see where this year heads. Uh, we've just had the RBA increase the cash rate again by 24 basis points um, and you know no talks of that slowing down following a, a high inflation print of 7.8% I think uh, at a headline level in, in Australia. So obviously still counteracting that. If we look at the, uh, the growth of inflation over the last little while and then uh, the trailing pursuit with the cash rate after the fact. Um, and, and look at sort of the historical trends of, of the cash rate, which we'll get into later, I'm sure it's in this, this housing chart back report. Um, you know, my personal hope and, and see is we sort of at the, the semi peak of the rate rise cycle, um, not saying that it can't go up another percent or a percent and a half, anything more than that would be really, really pushing the boundaries. But what I mean by that is as soon as we start to see a lower inflation print or inflation coming down in Australia, I personally feel like we'd come back to something around sort of this level, if not lower in the cash rate, just given um, how rapidly it's increased uh, in the last little while. I think, you know, the main the main consensus is trying to hit the um, consumer confidence and, uh, just, you know, stop everyone from sp spending so much or all of the savings that are accumulated during the COVID pandemic where we couldn't spend money has been spent and is continuing to being spent, which is impacting inflation uh, along with many other things. But, you know, ultimately it's trying to, change the sentiment of let's just go spend like crazy. Anyway, jump into the reports, we can get into that uh, a little bit later. Um, so interesting enough, the housing market has actually come down in value. Last month it was $9.3 trillion um, residential real estate. This month it's $9.2 trillion, so the total value has actually come down. Um, but still when we compare that to superannuation at 3.3 and then listed stocks at 2.9 and then commercial real estate at 1.3, um, it's still nearly three times uh, bigger than any other sort of industry in terms of superannuation or listed stocks, which is awesome. There's about 11 million dwellings uh, on the market. Outstanding mortgage debt is about 2.2 trillion. So again, you know, looking at a 25, 30% LBR there uh, nationally. Uh, most of the 57% of household wealth is, is held in housing and a lot of that is sort of generational wealth. Um, as we can see, majority of that would be essentially debt free. Um, apart from sort of the younger generation now sort of buying their own their own assets, there is uh, a big number of the older generation who are essentially sitting on debt free uh, real estate. They don't, they're not phased by the property market in terms of whether it grows up or down. Uh, they're just happy in their, their home or their home that they've been in for the last 30 years. And so, you know, when we talk about these, you know, interest rate cliffs, and again, there was one that was talked about in, I think, September of 2020, when it was sort of in the middle of COVID. I know it was September one year. Um, you know, everyone was talking about this economic cliff uh, of, you know, interest rates. We're going to, I mean, fixed mortgages were going to roll over and there's going to be this cliff where everyone started to cop it on the chin and uh, all that sort of stuff. And it never, never equated, it never happened. And so, um, you know, obviously there is going to be an impact with a lot of people coming off fixed rates at 1.9% or whatever the lowest they, they potentially could get. And now they're going to get a bit of a shock with 5.5% interest rate or something silly. So um, it is going to be a big change for people. But again, you know, people know it's coming. They've had incredible savings over the last little while. And so hopefully there's some decent buffers there to su survive a period of higher interest rate repayments. Um, but we will see what happens. Not saying it's not going to happen, but when we look at the overall national LBR of 20, 25%, um, or, or even 30%, it's not going to impact everyone. And I think that's a really important factor. Um, there are definitely going to be some, um, some blood spilt. There's definitely going to be some pain points. There's going to be some hardships. And, you know, I really feel sorry for, for those, especially for the people who have made a, a move on the back of the RBA saying that they're not going to increase interest rates until the end of 2024. Um, you know, I think saying something like that and taking action on it has a big impact. Um, I know they're being investigated for it now, which I think is important. But, um, you know, when we think of the majority of the, the housing market, it's debt free. Um, and so these interest rate movements up and down fluctuations, fixed rates rolling off aren't going to impact the majority of real estate holders. And I think that's really important to sort of factor in as we start to move into the rest of this year. 
Um, sales per annum is about half a mil, and then gross value of sales is around $445 billion. That's a billion with a B. Uh, massive industry here in Australia. We love our property. So dwelling values in, over the last three months nationally have come down 3.2% uh, in the three months to January, so decline about a, a percentage per month there. Uh, over the last 12 months, we're down 7%, so it's been slower on the back of the 12 months compared to the three months. Uh, it's only coming down sort of 0.6 of a percent per month over the last 12 months. So the rate of decline, um, and I'm sure we'll visually see this, it has sort of tampered off a little bit, but you know we have been declining more over the last three months than the last 12 months at that, at that rate. And then nationally, the monthly, uh, the monthly pace of decline eased through January. January saw national home values decline up negative 1%, reaffirming an easing in the rate of decline since the negative 1.6% fall recorded in August. So um, rate of decline was at its, its trough, it wasn't at its peak, but it was at, it was at the lowest, its trough in, uh, in August last year, which is really important. And I can sort of see, you know, we are still declining, but with the rate of decline has stabilized. Uh, three months changes, so Australia's 3.2, regionals is 2.6, and then capitals is 3.3. So typically what we see is that um, higher valued property or you know that 25 percentile starts to come off which is generally in the capital city starts to come off first uh, and the rest of the the country trails that we can see the worst performers are hobart and brizzy um, and then sydney and melbourne not far behind it darwin perth and adelaide uh you know sort of still coming down but not as a, as aggressively as the rest of the nation uh, melbourne's quite an interesting one get just given sort of where it's you know where it, what happened during the covid pandemic i mean some asset prices did increase but not as quickly as sort of sydney and so we're sort of seeing not as as much of a decline as we are in sydney it kind of always just trails sydney um, by about a percentage or so um, and then when we look at our quarterly change in dwelling values combined capitals uh, versus the rest of the state they're relatively um cyclical you can see some major ups and downs we are sort of on the way on the bounce back up now it doesn't mean we're in positive territory but as i was saying before the rate of decline has bounced back we're still in a decline um, but we're not sort of falling at that that higher rate where it looks like the combined capitals are sort of averaging out there where the rest of state is actually bouncing back um, a little bit nicer as well which makes sense with the whole sort of sea change tree change during during the covid pandemic um, you know, the, the rest of state seems to be stabilizing as I think that sort of work from home movement has continued to flow through. Uh, 12 month change, so regionals um, really supporting or, or being a lot more solid than the combined capitals. Um, so of the negative 7.2% over the 12 months, you know, 8.7% is that is, is of that is the capitals, where negative 2.3 is the regionals, which is really interesting to see. We can see that they're both still declining quite rapidly um, they are still on the decline we're not seeing that bounce back on the three month change just because it's a different time frame um, but it'd be interesting to watch this over the next couple of months to either sort of stabilize out um, and sort of start to see this trend follow suit over the 12 month period um, but again we can see uh, hobart sydney melbourne really leading the charge here at um, nearly 10 percent for all three of those canberra is not far behind at nearly six percent and then brisbane's not far behind at nearly five percent um, but again, Darwin, Perth, Adelaide was still seeing positive territory over the last 12 month period, uh, which is great to see. Combined capital, so the rolling quarterly change in values, uh, we can see that Brisbane is starting to bounce back a little bit, even though it's still leading the decline at negative 4.8. Um, and then on the right hand side, we can see Hobart is, is um, still in the decline and that's at negative 5.5, so definitely leading, leading the charge there. Um, but Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, and essentially Adelaide, even though Adelaide's still in the decline phase, they're starting to um, tamper out and starting to see that bounce back. Well, we've seen the bounce back and now they're starting to stabilize, uh, which is good to see. It's not like it's still rapidly in free fall. Um, it just depends how long we'll stay in this decline period. If we look historically, sort of between January 18 and the start of, um, or maybe the middle, middle of, Jan of um, 2019, the market was sort of steadily in decline there. So, you know, about a 12 month 18 month period that it was in decline between um this little gap here we've got um and obviously i'm just looking at the left hand side chart not the right hand side chart but that is a little bit more um skewed with all the different markets that are showing there uh but the three majors being sydney melbourne and brisbane is sort of what i'm focusing on here um if we look at what looks like to be sort of late 2020 um mid 2021 the decline was only there for you know less than six months and then you know we started to decline halfway through uh, 2022 if not at the start of 2022 so we already have been in this decline for a little while um, it's gonna be interesting to see how long we stay there for capital cities uh, we can see that in sydney melbourne brisbane and hobart that that top 20 75th 
percentile is really driving the decline. Uh, interesting to see that the 50th and 75th are starting to average out in Sydney, which is an interesting sign. It's starting to mean that um, you know all houses are declining at the same rate or have declined at the same rate. It's not those really high valued properties that are dropping off quickly because they can. Um, you know, the whole market's starting to stabilize now, which is really important to see. It's that bounce back starting to come back. The whole market's performing together. When we compare that to something like Brisbane, um, you know, personally, we've been looking to buy in the Gold Coast for a little while and properties during COVID grew nearly 70% in the Gold Coast, which is pretty uh, insane. And then, you know, if we look at the bottom 75th percentile, it's only at negative 1.7%. So again, it's that still the high end of the market that's really driving the decline, um, followed suit by the rest of the market. So we're really looking for that stabilization within all values within the market, which represents that solid or more stable bounce back and then starting to go back into positive territory. Housing cycles, so the 28 day growth rate in the CoreLogic uh, Home Value Index. I don't know why they call it growth. They should really call it, it's not always growing. <laughs> um, anyway, the rolling 28 day change in combined capitals home value index was negative 0.9 through the 28 days ending to February 7th. Over the past 28 days, the rolling growth rate eased from negative 1% fall through to the end of January and a negative 1.1 decline in December. Uh, rolling eight days in combined capitals. Yeah, so we can really start to see here that uh, over the last 28 days, if we if we go back to August 22, um, and we're taking that 28 day change, looks like the daily um, update here, we really are starting, if, if you look at the trend, it is upwards. You know, we've come from sort of negative 1.5 and looks like now we're at sort of negative uh, 0 0.9. So not a massive change. We're still in decline obviously but the trend is upwards uh, which is good to see it's not like we're in a massive decline and it is quite it is quite stable as well it's not like it's aggressively moving up or down um, on a 28 day rolling index you'd presume it'd be quite stable but uh, good to see that trend starting to head back up and stabilize um into sydney so in january dwelling values fell uh, negative 1.2 percent over the quarter they're at negative 3.9 percent and over the past year they're down 13.8 percent um so yep strong decline from the sydney market over the last 12 months um, fairly solid over the last quarter and we're starting to stabilize over January. Uh, what I really like about this chart is you can start to see uh, each month on month the, the rate of decline. So it looks like the peak rate of decline was um, one, two, three, four, five months ago. Again, looking at sort of that August time frame, the, um, the line here is that annual change. So again, not gonna see that stabilization come through just because it's on a larger time period. But if we look at, um, oh, this is, sorry, this is actually quarterly change. Um, so if we go back, you know, a, a fair bit, is that quarterly? It's more than it's not more than four quarters in a year. It might be a monthly change. I don't know. Um, yeah, it looks like there's like twelve months between these two, so that's interesting. Um, but anyway, we can start to see that starting to stabilise and come back up, which is good to see. Melbourne's down one point one, quite similar to Sydney uh, for the month. Uh, negative three point one, a little bit less than Sydney over the quarter, and negative nine point three over the last twelve months. Again, performing a little bit better than Sydney. Again, can't see too much happening on the annual change graph, but interesting on the quarterly change or what I think might be monthly change. I don't know. Um, Core logic's pretty solid, so I'm not going to doubt them, but it uh, looks like it's monthly. Uh, we do see that stabilization coming up, but the last two months have actually started to go down again. So um, not dramatically, not crazily, but if you look historically, there's you can typically spot the trend. Uh, when it starts to go up, starts to go up, and it starts to come down, starts to come down. So. Um, when we're looking for trends here, I mean, the, the trend is upwards. Um, the lowest point is still um, lower than where we are today. However, you know, there's no real solid trend. You can't draw, draw a straight line through it and sort of not predict, but assume where we're going. Uh, Brizzy down 1.4%. So that's probably the strongest decline so far that we've seen. I'm just going to skip ahead. Um, our Hobart's down 1.7. Um, so second strongest decline in the Brizzy market. Um, quarterly's down 48 I just want to check again if that's, uh, again, Hobart's 5.8. I've already seen this data. So um, yeah, quarterly is down 4.8. And then over the past year, we're down um, 4.7. So this is a really different market to look at compared to Sydney and Melbourne. You can see essentially since before January 2021, we were doing nothing. It was stagnant. And I remember, you know, talking in podcasts and stuff like that um, way before this, the, you know, that time period, it was just kind of like a stagnant market, like nothing was really going on for ages. Um, and I never forget, someone said to me, um, don't sleep on Brisbane. Uh, and look what's happened over the last sort of two years, which has been been sort of phenomenal and crazy. Uh, but solid growth between, you know, mid-2020 until mid-2022, uh, when we start to sort of see the clients. So two years of really strong growth there. We can see the annual change really, really peaks quite high um, uh, on that one. And now we're starting to see the decline. The good news is that the decline is trending upwards based on its lowest point. So... Um, that's really, really interesting to see. 
um, Brisbane values are now down 10% below the record high, which was in June 2022. Um, so Brizzy's now off about 10% from where we were. Adelaide down 0.8%, uh, down 1.5% over the quarter, and then down six, uh, still up 6.9% from where it was uh, this time last year, which is great to see. Uh, Adelaide Valley dwelling values are now negative 2.1% below the record high, which was July 2022. So still another 6.9% to come off from Adelaide to get back to where they were sort of 12 months ago. I think that's still you know a pretty solid sign. We can see that the annual change is um, heading downward. We can see that the quarterly change, so on so called the quarterly change is on a negative trend, um, but it's not big numbers. It's not like aggressively. I mean, it, the, the decline is getting larger, which is interesting to see, but it's not like it's the same numbers as what we were seeing for the markets beforehand at you know sort of five, 3% average. Um, Perth, pretty stagnant, even though still in decline over the quarter, we're down 0.1%, uh, which is interesting. So January is obviously, um, you know, pretty negative compared to where the, the quarter's at. We're sort of seeing that stronger decline come through in that January period, but still up 2.7% over the last year, which is great to see. Um, Hobart, again, being that biggest driver, we're down 1.7% in January, down 5.5% on the quarter, and then uh, over the past year, down negative 9.5%, um, and then we're down 10.8% over the record highs, which was in May 2022. Um, so some of these major markets are now starting to get sort of 10, 11% in decline, which is huge. Uh, we can see the trajectory for Hobart is still in the in the downward uh, change, with a, even with a quarterly number, and pretty aggressively on the downward decline for that annual change as well. Um, don't know the Hobart market too well if um, if there's good reasoning or um, other situations or factors that's impacting these numbers other than outside of the highs and lows of the COVID period and um, essentially free money over that period. Let me know, but interesting to see that this is really, really driving a big decline. Um, Darwin, again, essentially uh, 0.1, so flat lining uh, over the quarter at negative 0.4, and then over the last year, we're still up 3.7%. However, Darwin values have now um, declined 11.2% below the record high, which was in May 2014. So still seeing some of the long-term effects of um, you know different market cycles and mining booms and everything else like that. Not that I know that there was one in May 2014, um, only just sort of presuming there, but you can see, see that, you know, the market is still down 11% from where they were in 2014, which is nearly 10 years ago, um, and has been pretty stagnant ever since. You can even if you have a look at sort of that historical data, um, you know, for majority of this chart, it's been in negative territory. Uh, it's only during the COVID period where it's increased quite significantly, which is probably good for the Darwin market, and then um, sort of stabilised back out to where we are now today. Canberra uh, in December, I think that's meant to read January. Uh, Canberra dwelling values declined by negative 1%. Over the quarter, values are down 3.4. Over the past year, dwelling values are down uh, nearly 6%. Canberra dwelling values are now down 8.6% below the record high, which was in June 2022. So looking like the peak of the market was back in June period of 2022. Um, we're now sort of six or seven months, nearly eight months away from that. So um, good sort of time frame if we're thinking about you know market cycles and how long times genuinely change. Um, that's a that's a long period of time, especially for the for the housing market. And I know we've had economic factors that have impacted things that you know we can't forecast or um, look at, but you know, there's a long time in decline, and you know you can start to see that trend back on the way up there um, in the quarterly change, even though the annual change hasn't been impacted. Sales and listings. Uh, so national sales sales volumes continue to trend lower as buyer demand slows. CoreLogic estimates that in the 12 months to January there were about 500,000 sales nationally, down negative 19% compared to the previous year. While down compared to last year volume, sales estimates that are still 4.6% above the decade average annual sales volume. So even though we're up about 5% on the decade, which you know a lot changes over 10 years, uh, compared to where we were last year, it's down 20%. Now that's a huge number, and if you wanna just understand what I mean by huge, look at the monthly sales volumes uh, in this January 23 period. Um, it is essentially fallen off a cliff. Um, you know, there's hardly any listings starting to happen, and you do sort of see that in every January. Um, so the bounce back up will be interesting to see, but comparing it to last year, we're still down negative 19%, which is a phenomenal amount. And a lot of the commentators and sort of what we're hearing about the market at the moment is the shortage of supply is what's really underpinning the market. There's still enough buyers out there given the supply pool. So when we talk about supply and demand, um, you know, it's what's sort of holding values the way that it was. And a lot of people are worried if a lot of stock does start to come on the market and, you know, it's still hard to borrow, then there's not going to be as much demand. And obviously that will result in prices falling if sellers are in the position where they were forced to have to sell. Um, but everyone's kind of sitting on their fingers or sorry, sitting on their hands, just sort of understanding what's going to happen in the market, what's going to happen with interest rates and all those sorts of things. If they do start to significantly come up uh, and up and up and up and up the way that they have, there are going to be people out there that do have to sell. 
um, when we look at that as a, as a portion, you know, people with loans is less than sort of 25, 30% um, of the market value uh, as, as a percentage figure. And so, you know, that's potentially 25, 30% of people who might have to force sell. If that happens, you know, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of properties that will come on the market, but you know, it's a quarter of what's out there. So not everyone's gonna have to sell, but there might be a majority of people that will have to sell, which obviously will bring a lot of supply on the market. And if they're forced to sell, that could potentially start to bring values down um, given what we're seeing here. But again, you know, I'm not predicting this big sort of economic or housing cliff as they say, uh, but it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next sort of six to 12 months. Could be a very different story. Median days on market, this will be an interesting one. So at the national level, properties are taking longer to sell. In the three months to January, the median days on market was 37, uh, up from a low of 20 days in the three months to November 2021. So now taking about a month and a half uh, for combined capitals, and then if regionals are at 44 days, um, sorry, 44 days is about a month and a half for uh, combined regionals. And then capitals, you know, still selling within sort of a month, might be like a, an auction campaign, a four week auction campaign, passing in and then maybe selling the week after once the vendor's expectations have been reset. Um, buyers are feeling like they're getting a bargain and getting at a better, better price, um, but still selling within sort of 34 days, which is a month. Um, so that's interesting to see, but then obviously combined regionals um, have always been a little bit behind the capitals in terms of days on market, but now taking about a month and a half uh, for a, a regional property to sell. Leading the charge there is Northern Territory at about 60 days or two months. And then the shortest time frames. Um, Regional TAS is at 12 days, which is crazy. Oh, sorry, no, I'm looking at 2022 data. If I look at 2023 data, uh, Perth at 22 days, looks like it's leading the charge. Yeah, so still only 22 days to sell a property in Perth, uh, which is which is real interesting. And then leading the charge for days on market is Darwin at nearly 45 day, 54 days. Um, Brisbane's at 30, Melbourne's at 30, and Sydney's at 41, which is interesting. So maybe two or three weeks after an auction campaign, now in Sydney, a, a property selling, uh, which is interesting to see. There might be a bit of back and forth and kerfuffling with agents and buyers um, to get the sale done. Vendor discounting, similarly, so these two numbers sort of counter cyclically act together. Uh, similarly, vendor discounting has also uh, expanded from negative 9.2% in the three months to November 2021. In the three months of January 2023, uh, the vendor, the median vendor discounting on a national level was negative 4.3%. Um, so vendors happen to discount from their advertised price about 4.3%, uh, which is interesting to see. During the peak, it was only sort of around that negative 9 or 2.9%, and nearly, you know, another percentage point, more than another percentage point, nearly uh, one and a half percentage points um, of additional discounting from vendors. Uh, listing in the four weeks to uh, January 2023, the volume of new listings totaled 26,000. Nationally, while new listings have uh, risen rapidly from the seasonal low, new listings are still negative 24.3% lower than the previous five-year average. Um, so yeah, again, that's, that's a huge number, at sort of negative 20%, even compared to the five-year average being at negative 24%. Uh, that's pretty crazy. It's you know a quarter less than what we were seeing now, uh, or sort of seeing as on average over the last five years. So again, listings coming onto the market are really slow and that's underpinning the market, a lack of supply. Um, if that's, it's, it's actually quite a good thing. So if that number starts to come up dramatically um, and the demand sort of stays where it is, then that's when we're starting to see issues. But I think generally that's a, a good thing to see is a lack of supply. Vendors are still able to hold onto their properties. They're not in any mortgage stress or any stress. I mean, they might be, but they're willing to sacrifice other things first before they go into further mortgage stress, not having to do a forced sale just yet. Um, and listings are quite low on the market. Um, at a national level, there was 127,000 listings observed over the four weeks to 29 of January. Total listings are still uh, markedly lower than the previous five-year average. So compared to the five-year average nationally, we're down 30%. What was this? Is this just capitals or something? Number of new listings and then number of total listings. Okay, so new listings coming onto the market are down, uh, but their total listings overall um, is down nearly 30%, which is, is very significant. Uh, new listings advertised were down relative to the same period of last year across most regions, while the balance of total listing stock is more fixed. In Hobart, Camera and some Canberra and some regional markets, total listings are now lifting relative to the same period in January 2023. Um, so again, just a different way of looking at the numbers that we were looking at beforehand, but uh, Sydney and Melbourne are down about 25% on average. Brisbane's not far behind at 22%. Um, Perth not far behind and Darwin's about the same. Uh, but Hobart's... Um, in the positive and then Adelaide is down 8.4 and Canberra is down 11.6, which is really interesting to see. 
Um, so new listings change. Um, well, that's interesting to see in Hobart, and maybe that's why Hobart is really driving the uh, the decline in 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 the decline in values because there is a lot of stock on the market, and maybe vendors are more happy. Do they have vendor discounting in Hobart? No. Uh, yeah, vendor discounting in Hobart. Yeah, it's not out of the ordinary. It's sort of like four point five. Um, but again. Having a lot more listings means there's a lot more stock on the market, a uh, lot more supply, and with all the demand getting pulled out with the higher interest rates and economic uncertainties, maybe that's why the Hobart market is driving the decline. Um, and then total listings is really, really high at 88% um, change for the equivalent period last year. So at the same time last year, there's 88% more listings on the market, which again would obviously raise the supply in the um, demand supply equation and potentially why there's uh, you know a major decline happening. Weekly clearance rate, so the combined capital city, city, uh, city's clearance rate was 61% for the week ending in the 29th of January. While this was much of a stronger result than the final weeks of 2022, the volume of auctions was still moving through the seasonal low as the volumes rise in the coming weeks. This will prove more substantial test for the strength of the auction market. I think that's a really good point. A um, couple things to note on this. Um, anything above sort of a 70% clearance rate would be considered a seller's market, so a stronger market. Anything below 60% would be considered a buyer's market. And then that, between that sort of 60 to 70%, um, sort of, you know, both sides of the equation, but we're on the lower side of that number, which is interesting to see. And then the second thing that's important is if we look at a, and I know this is at a national level, so it's almost irrelevant, but um, if we look at the peak here in January 2021, and we look at the trend, it is continuing to come down, and we're seeing a bit of a pull down over the last sort of January period, which is expected through um, through the Christmas holidays. But yeah, interesting to see there what's happening with the clearance rate. Uh, rental market. Um, so the annual growth in rent values is slightly in January to 10.1%. Annual growth in Australian rent values recently peaked over the 12 months to December at 10.2%. Uh, the unusually high growth in annual rent growth has partially been driven by growth. There's a lot of growth in that sentence. In unit rents across Sydney, Melbourne, and Brisbane, where rents have increased around 14 to 16% annually. Absolutely insane. Um, you know, that's a $500 property growing at, you know, 14 or let's say 15% on average is uh you know five 50 60 70 80 bucks um something like that which is huge especially you know um if, if wages haven't increased and in other inflation inflationary costs have increased as well wages have essentially stayed the same um, there's a lot that's coming more out of everyday pockets uh, which is a real shame but obviously needed to support the higher increase in interest rates as well um, and this is the thing this is the flow and effect of all of the rba's decisions is uh, it's not just homeowners or investors that are feeling it, it's also gonna be renters as well. They're essentially being forced here to pay higher rents due to the higher cost to hold onto these properties. Um, what'll be really interesting though is these rental increases will be bringing forward from the next couple of years, given that, you know, I mean, average you could sort of say is maybe three to 5%. So if you look back to January 18, it's been quite stagnant, the rental period. So there is an element here that we're actually now um, bringing, bringing back the rental market where it should have been, where that growth rate of sort of three to five percent should be, um, but depending on how high or how long this period of um, rental increases sustained, we might be starting to bring forward some rental increases into the future as well. And that's why it's really important to understand that every market has its different cycles. Um, there's thousands of submarkets across Australia, and so each property in those thousands of markets will perform differently and have their own cycles. Same with the with the rental market; it's a completely different market as well. It does tend to not well, like I forgot the word but flow um, be or counter cyclical to the growth rates because as the values of property come up rents typically or rental yield typically come down um, if rent stays the same and then vice versa right if the market comes down um, and rent stay the same but if the market comes down like the values of property and rent stay the same and the, the yield comes down um, but in this case what we're seeing is the markets coming down and rents are going up and so we're sort of seeing this change of 14 to 16 percent nationally um, is quite is quite crazy. So Brisbane, Melbourne, Perth, Adelaide, and Sydney really leading the charge all above um, nine and a half percent there. Melbourne being the weakest at nine and a half and Adelaide being the strong and Brisbane being the strongest at thirteen percent. Rental yields, so through January 2023, Australian gross rent yields rose to 3.9%, up from a recent low of 3.21% a year earlier. Uh, this is the highest rental yield since November 2019. Gross rental yields, so are roughly about 3.9% across the country. Regionals is at 4.5, combined capitals is at 3.6, Darwin's at 6.3, which is a really high yield, and Sydney being the lowest is at 32 
Um, and you know, that's that's a really important data point is, uh, you know, those blue chip, really unique assets uh, do have a lower rental yield because the growth rate has outperformed the rental market. And so they come with a lower yield. So Sydney, Melbourne at that 3.2, 3.3% level. Darwin, the value of properties hasn't increased. The peak of the market was back in 2014, if you remember from the pre previous um, data that we were just looking at. And so if the rents have increased significantly over that period, but prices have essentially stagnated or stayed the same, um, or still below where they were 10 years ago, obviously that's gonna come at a higher yield at 6.3%. And that's why I typically don't like looking at rental yield as, you know, on, on its own as a metric to sort of go, oh, this is a good resulting property. Because typically a high rental yield, um, depending on the market and the other data, is an indicator that the value of the properties haven't increased at a rate uh, faster than rent has. So it could actually be a negative indicator or a negative data point. That's why it's really important to look at all the different data points together. Uh, dwelling approvals and housing credit. So overall, dwelling approvals rose 18.5% in December, led by a rebound in unit approvals. Oh, that's good. Which remains volatile. Uh, housing, house approvals declined 2.4% in a month. Makes sense. And have trended below the decade average since September last year. Um, which, you know, good to see that units are bouncing back. I think that's a good thing. But, you know, if you sort of look where that line is, it's not too different to sort of where it's been at that 2017 that's actually the decade average, it's bang on the decade average, so no major impact is there, although you know it has trended below over the last five to six years, uh, which is not a great sign. You actually want that to be a bit above, but where we are now is against the decade average. Um, and then sad to see that the housing has come down. I mean, it makes sense just given the lending environment and um, construction and costs being quite high with inflation um, and trades and everything else like that. Uh, supply is really the way to fix the current housing market. And so, um, you know, to see that come down is is uh, is pretty sad, but expected. Finance and lending, so new housing finance secured total 23.4 billion in December, down 4.3% from November. The combined value of new finance secured in a month was down around 1 billion. Half of the de uh, decline was from the owner occupiers who are not first home buyers. Uh, monthly value of new finance committed total in millions. So investors are down and owner occupier are down. We can sort of see a bigger decline with the owner occupiers, which is what they were stating before. And then portion of new lending from investment housing, excluding refinances, um, is still around that decade average of around 33, 34%. Um, and just sort of tapering there, still sort of holding, you know, that, that big bounce up that we saw during the COVID period where money was cheap. Interesting to sort of see where that's gonna go over the next little while. Um, but good to see that investment housing is sort of staying where, it, you know, a bit of an average level, uh, not coming down that, like drastically compared to um, the value of finance commitments. Uh, investor and lending. So nationally, investor finance compromised 33.6% of new mortgage lending through the month of December. This is below the decade average of 34.6%. Investor finance declined negative 4.4% in the month and is down 28.4% compared with April 2022 before the RBA started to lift the cash rate. Um, so we can see here, New South Wales, Victoria, and Queensland, South Australia, are all pretty solid around uh, above that sort of 32% range and this is uh, investors as total lending wa uh, is at about 29 percent, so a little bit less and taz has now come off significantly at 26 percent um, really reflecting that data that we're sort of seeing in hobart with a major decline coming through um, biggest investor or percentage of lending as investors in new south wales not unexpected at 37 percent lowest is in northern territory at about 20.7 percent um, averaging around that 34 percent range First home buyers, so the value of first home buyer finance fell negative 4.6% through to December. First home buyer finance accounted for 23.6% of owner occupier fi finance in the month, which is just below the decade average compared with April 2022. Monthly first home buyer finance has declined negative uh, 24.6%. So first home buyer as a percentage of owner occupier finance commitments is, um, you know, in Victoria, still the strongest, has been the strongest for the last little while. Um, Pretty confusing graph on the left-hand side, too many data points and movements up and down. But if you look at the right-hand side, uh, first home buyer has a percentage of owner-occupied housing commitments in December 2022. Um, weakest market is New South Wales at 20.3%, which is quite funny. Um, maybe much harder for first home owner, uh, buyers to get in there. Um, and then leading the charge at 25.9% is WA, uh, which is an easier market for first home buyers to get into. Cool, this is what I wanted to look at at the start of the conversation. This one's going for a little while as well. Um, the RBA lifted the cash rate to 3.35% in February. Statement highlights are, number one, global inflation remains high but is moderating in response to lower uh, uh, energy prices, supply chain resolutions, and tighter monetary policy. Number two, the central forecast for inflation in 2023 is 4.75%, followed by 3% in mid-2025. GDP growth is expected to slow to 1.5% in 2023 and 2024, and unemployment is expected to reach 4.5% between 
uh, mid-2025. So really interesting there. Um, you know, really aiming for inflation to come off by at least 3% this year. That's the target for the RPA, uh, which is a, a big thing to do. But once it starts to come down, hopefully it will start to come down quite rapidly. And then sort of moderating in 2025 at 3%, whether they'll get to 4.75%, I don't know. Definitely not at an average level, I don't think, um, over the year. But it'd be interesting to see if they can. Um, we've all seen the economy change quite rapidly over the last little while. Um, GDP is expected to slow down, so they're really starting to um, acknowledge that they're going to slow down the economy during that period. Um, and employment's, unemployment's not looking too bad, but is definitely coming up quite significantly. Um, and then what I was talking to you beforehand is if we look at these periods where interest rates have increased quite rapidly in short periods, they're generally followed by periods of slowing down. So if we look back in Feb uh, 08, went quite high and then fell you know, from 7.25 down to 3, so 4.25 percentage points. Went up again in... 2012, um, from 3% to 4.75%, so 1.75% increase, and then it's essentially been in decline for 15 years until uh, the start or end of 2022, or mid-2022, I should say. And then, you know, we've never seen, and there was even, you know, the January break uh, where they don't make a decision is the only time where they've decided not to increase, the only month they've decided not to increase. We've never seen anything that smooth of a growth rate uh, compared to historical movements. So really taking a big leap of faith to counteract inflation to do this. And that's why, in my personal opinion, no financial advice, that I genuinely feel that once inflation starts to come down, they will quite rapidly drop the cash rate. It might not be a significant amount, might not be like 2 or 3% straight away, but I feel like they will taper it off quite quickly um, just to help people's back pockets, depending on what happens to GDP and unemployment. Um, some other notes here. So the RBA noted that they are keeping a close eye on labour costs, which are continuing to pick up on recent lows. Uh, the board acknowledged that a lag in operational monetary policy and then that is uncertain about the timing and extent of a slowdown in, the, in housing spending. The board expects that the further increase in interest rates will be needed over the month ahead to ensure that inflation returns to the target and that this period of high inflation is only temporary. Yeah, really important. Cool. Uh, housing credit. So through November... Average new fixed rates remain elevated on variable rates for owner occupiers and investors. Average new variable rates for owner occupier loans increased 238 basis points since the low in April 2022. Uh, crazy to sort of see that growth, you know, when it's almost doubled. Uh, you can sort of see these fixed rate for three years reached what looks like just above or even at or just below 2%. And now if we follow that purple line, we're at 5. percent um, or eight, so more than doubling, nearly even tripling, uh, which is huge. You can see this variable rate has essentially stayed the same um, up until that sort of May period where we started to increase, and now it's at 4.79. And then uh, for investors, uh, essentially following suit. What's really interesting to note is generally this fixed rate is an indicator of um, you know what all the major banks sort of think and where they think rates are going to go. We had this period back here, and then we're starting to see a bit of a uh, still sort of pursuing that higher range. But when we start to see a tick off in the fixed rate loans, it'll be interesting. That's all the banks sort of forecasting that things will average out. Uh, mortgage originations for the riskier types of lending trended notably lower through the September quarter of 2022. The portion of loans originated with a debt to income ratio of six or more fell 17.1%, down from 23.3% in September 2021 quarter. And the loan to income ratios of six or more dropped to 7.3% in the quarter. This is all really, um, always really good information. Um, so I'm gonna go through them. So on the left-hand side, what percentage of loans on interest-only terms? So um, around that 20% number, which is still higher than sort of the average over the last little, couple of years, percentage of loans originated with a loan to income uh, greater than 6%, that's dropped off significantly. So um, riskier lending over the last 12 months, uh, 24 months, we're now back to 7.3%, which is where we were sort of pre-pandemic, uh, which is really, really good to see. So less riskier lending. Percentage of loans originated with a debt to income ratio of greater than 6%. Again, sort of seeing the same thing back to really those low levels pre-pandemic at 17.1%. Um, over the last sort of 24 months, they've been higher above that 21% range. So again, less riskier lending. And then percentage of loans originated with an LVR greater than 90%. Um, really sort of seeing that come off. Um, and the trend is, is much lower, which is interesting. So maybe loans over time will be harder to get at that 90% range, but you know, peaked at sort of 14% uh, for owner occupiers, and now we're down to 8%, so nearly half of where we were. And for investors, um, you know, peaked again at 5.2% in March 2021, and now we're at 23, oh, sorry, 2.3. Um, so less than half of where we were in terms of loans at 90%, so less riskier lending, uh, lending in the current economic environment, which is generally good to see. 
um, this is a new one and I did have, I saw like the newsletter that came through and saw this on there. So this is really interesting to go through. So how far would dwelling values need to fall before returning to pre-COVID levels? Housing values would need to fall substantial further across most regions before wiping out the COVID gains. Melbourne is the exception, haha, where values would only need to fall a further 0.4% from the end of January before returning to March 2022 levels. Um, yeah, and that's, you know, we didn't really see too much crazy growth during um, that COVID period in Melbourne. And, and now we can sort of see that those falls start to come down. So at an average level, you know, it's sort of, Staying, staying at the same. Um, nationally, to get to the same point, we need to come off another 13%. Regionally, uh, to come off the same range, again, we need to come down negative 23.7%, uh, and then combined capitals is negative 9.5%. The rest of the country, again, is sort of arranging that, averaging at 23%. And then if we talk about the top three, so Brisbane needs to fall another 21% to get to that same range. Sydney, only sort of 6.9%, and then Melbourne, essentially, sort of where we were before. So, um, you know, biggest drop needs to be Adelaide, but Brisbane is still 21% off from where it was pre-pandemic, which is pretty crazy to see. Uh, and we've got some data references and disclaimers and everything else like that. Uh, that's a core logic chart, guys. That was uh, a lot to get through, uh, depending on sort of 15 minutes here, which is quite crazy. So um, definitely check that out. Love this, this graph and going through it at all points in time. Um, the second one is the, the housing economy and the financial markets. Um, so this is the RBA chart pack. And there's a couple of things that I like to go through this. So GDP uh, around the world is uh, tapering off, not to see, not seeing major declines there, which is really, really good to see. Um, where's Australia's GDP? Um, seeing a, a bit of a bounce up the year end there and the quarterly sort of averaging out as well. So GDP is still quite strong in Australia. Um, consumption is obviously the, stop, the top one, which is really impacting inflation and imports is uh, the negative one. So that's where sort of most of the money's coming out. Um, which is not, well, it means that we're not, importing as much as we used to uh, from a GDP standpoint, which is quite interesting to see. Um, CPI, so inflation, printed at a 7.8% level, which is crazy high uh, compared to where we were beforehand. Um, still on that upward trajectory with inflation. We break that to down to quarterly and seasonally adjusted. Really, it's still increasing at the same rate at where we were. We're not seeing sort of any declines in terms of that inflation print. Consumer sentiment, uh, we did see a little bounce back up not too long ago. We've now seen a little bit bounce back up, but really no strong sides of a solid bounce back to where we were. I think, you know, given that RBA is still increasing interest rates and we've had a higher inflation print, uh, consumer confidence is potentially still gonna stay quite low for the next sort of six months. Uh, pricing to household debt has starting to come down, um, which is really good to see, um, you know, sort of bringing those household debt ratios back into check business, NAB business survey um, has come down a little bit, which is interesting. So business conditions have come down, business confidence is still averaging out, and then capacity utilization is coming down a little bit as well. Uh, lending to business is still solid. Credit growth, we went through an occupier and housing in the core logic chart, but business credit growth is still increasing, tapering off a little bit, but still increasing. Uh, wage price index, um, starting to see a bit of an increase there, which is good and bad. The good news is that will help out with the high inflation costs coming through and the higher cost of living, those higher rents, those higher um, interest repayments. And then, uh, I don't know about you guys, but my weekly grocery bills almost doubled uh, over the last sort of two to three years. So um, something to really, I mean, we have had a child in that time, but um, starting to really help the wage, the wage growth is starting to counteract that. The thing that we don't wanna see though is major wage increase increase um, because what that will do is allow people to be more comfortable with the higher costs and then creates this like upward spiral of prices increasing people earning more money spending more money prices increasing so on and so forth um, so you almost want wage prices to come down um, which means people are less willing to spend money which tapers back inflation um, region and industries Australian balance volumes export RBA assets, um, so the term funding facility you can see is really, really strong um, and the domestic bonds is really, really strong from where we were um, in the previous financial years. See how big this change is, even back from what looks like, you know, 13, 12, 13, financial year back here, maybe even further, um, you know, that, that bond, that domestic bond purchase uh, and the term funding facilities are, are really, really high. Um, so it's gonna be interesting to sort of see how that change, um, and then the liabilities obviously is the counteract of that. Um, so what people owe, the exchange settlement balances is really, really high. Um, so yeah, you can sort of see how much money printing they've done. 
and the assets that they've got with the bonds that they've issued, um, the people buying the money that they printed. Um, there's so much assets that they've got on hand. This is why that inflation is really, really high because there's so much more money being printed and in the economy. Um, and so they're trying to counteract this now. But if you look at it relative to like all of the previous years, you can really start to understand why these num inflation numbers are, are starting to be quite high. And um, it's gonna be quite hard for them to, to counteract that. Uh, policy rates, cash rate, we've been through, bill swap rate is still um, on an upward trajectory, same as the the 10 year bill. Uh, bond rate is still you know staggering, which is good to see. It's not like on a solid upward trajectory. Um, but bond yields are always really important to sort of see where people's expectation of the cash rate is going to be. Um, spread between 10 year and the cash rate is starting to come down. So that's what I was just sort of seeing. So this is the spread between that 10 year bond yield and the cash rate. Um, so that expectation of where the cash rate is going to be is starting to come down, which is really, really good. Um, average household interest rates, we've been through fixed year, we've been through share market, bond market, exchange rates, banking indicators. Cool. That's a bit about it, guys. So um, there's some of the key graphs in the RBA charts that pack, pack that I like to look at in terms of the Australian economy. Um, definitely check that out as well. It comes out every month. Uh, something I like to keep on top of, even though things don't change too much month to month. Uh, it's good just to sort of see any um, initial changes um, and then we'll follow the trends and where the trajectories are starting to move within the charts over you know, a quarterly or six monthly period. Um, that's a bit of a, a market update, guys, to sort of see where things are at. Um, summary and, and takeaways, essentially, uh, everyone's sort of sitting on their hands, sort of seeing where the market's gonna, gonna go. I think the RBA are just waiting for inflation to start to slow down a little bit before they stop doing those interest rate increases. Um, I personally don't feel like, I personally feel like we're kind of at that point with the, the cash rate where, you know, if they really start to, if they start to increase another whole 100 basis points or one percentage, um, or you know, or more one and a half, two percent. There's a lot of people out there that are saying another one and a half percent. It's really, really going to be hurting people's back pockets, and they probably will commit to doing it just to make sure that the Australian economy um, comes down as I mean, this is safe, and you know, we're not going to spiral out of control. But it, you know, it is really going to hit, hit people's back pockets. Um, it's going to be a tough period to get through, and I think you know, we're in a, a turmoil period over the next sort of six to eighteen months at least. Um, not to say it's a bad time to invest. Sometimes either the best best times to invest or start a business or um, get through some some um, periods of time. If you're in that fortunate uh, position where you can take advantage of the current economy and still be financially stable, then you know some of the best startups in the world were created during downward periods and slower times in the economy. Um, how bad it will get, I don't think anyone really knows. Uh, it's just going to be really dependent on what happens with inflation. And you guys all saw how much bonds were printed and how much is uh, on the asset books of the RBA. So. Um, lots to consider there in terms of how much things can spiral, but I'm um, just going to keep on top of it and watching these charts moving forward. Um, all right, guys, sorry it's a bit of a long one today, but kept it under an hour, which is really important, and uh, I'll talk to you next month.